since I kind of prefaced some things before, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and we'll just preface it with the Word, and that way, you know, you won't leave here tonight in gloom and doom, <laughs> and you won't anyway, because the Holy Spirit's going to minister to us tonight. But, you know, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, he's talking about grief, right? He says, for godly grief and the pain God has permitted to direct. Uh, 3.10, sorry about that. 2 Corinthians 7, I'm sorry, 7.10. 2 Corinthians 7.10. Anyway, um, he says, for the godly grief and the pain God has permitted to direct. What, God directs pain? I thought he was only here to bless me. Well, it is a blessing, because listen what it does. It produces a repentant that leads and contributes to salvation and deliverance from evil. Now that is a blessing, right? Uh, it never brings regret, but worldly grief is deadly, breeding and ending in death. Okay, so if I talk about some things tonight that kind of grieves you, well, it grieves me too. But it's godly grief, and it ends in repentance, right? And deliverance from evil, and we need to be delivered from evil, right? But go to uh, Isaiah 61. I was telling Ray today that <clears throat> we were discussing, you know, where to go from here. Because we've talked about the timeline, and we still will. We're not going to give up talking about the timeline and the end times and all that and all the signs and wonders and all that stuff. But, you know, we've crossed a, we've crossed a line. You know, this last uh, lunar eclipse that we had the other night on the 20th, um, it was the seventh lunar eclipse in that series, right? You had the, you had the four... And then you had the three, that peripheral, right? Three on one side, three on the other. But in that, it would be the seventh. Well, seven is the number of completion in the Word. You can see that over in Revelation chapter 10. I think it's verse 6 and 7. But it's the number of completion. So something was completed, right? We're, we're moving into a new phase. And it started out with a real bang this week with a lot of different things. And did you notice that the night of the eclipse that a meteorite or something during the full lunar eclipse hit the moon at the same time? They've got it on film. That uh, either a meteor or something celestial hit the moon while it was in full eclipse. And I'm just saying, I mean, who knows what that was because we know there's war in the heavenlies. And it's, things are probably going to accelerate from here on out. I mean, when you have the state of New York legalizing abortion up until birth and they're laughing and smiling about it, it's wicked. It's wicked. Right? That's so wrong. But I was telling Ray, I said, I feel like I need to preach to the body. I need to preach. You know, we tell a lot of facts, and, you know, it's, it's anointed, and it's God's Word. But So I, I went home, and I thought, well, I'm going to look up that word, preach. But... So I went to Isaiah 61. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed and qualified me to preach the gospel of good tidings to the meek, the poor, and afflicted. Right? You know, uh, that's practically all the people that will listen. The meek, the poor, and the afflicted. The proud and the arrogant and the self-satisfied, they don't listen, right? He has sent me to bind up and heal the brokenhearted, 
and to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison <clears throat> and of the eyes of those who are bound. Right? Wow. Well, I looked up that word, preach. Okay? And in this particular verse, it's number 13, 19, and it means to be fresh to be full, rosy, or cheerful, right? To announce. Okay, so he, he's saying there to preach the gospel of good tidings to the meek and the poor and the afflicted, right? Okay, that's one kind of preaching. Okay, they're ready to receive. And, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit, right? They know they're poor in spirit and they need help, right? And God's that is right where God can help them. When they're looking up, God, I need help. And he's like, I know you do, and I want to help you. Right? But there's another kind. It's number 7121. All right? And this is through the idea of accosting in a hostile manner. That word preaching or preach. The idea of accosting in a hostile manner. That would be like when Jonah went and preached to Nineveh. He had to confront them with their idolatry. Okay? Both kinds of preaching are totally legitimate and right to the right audience. Right? It just depends on what the situation is and how the Holy Spirit decides, hey, you need to go do this. can be rosy and cheerful and fresh, or it can be, hey, buddy, you better straighten up or fly right, or God's going to wipe you all out, or God's going to pull his hand of protection back and the devil will wipe you all out. That would be the New Testament understanding of that, okay? So, you know, and he goes on in Isaiah 61 too, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God. Right? Well, you know, okay, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and a preposition, right, three and a half years later, the day of vengeance of our God. Another preposition. Fancy that. They're all over the Bible, right? All right, but you know what? If you know the acceptable year of the Lord, then you know the day of vengeance. Because it's all on a timeline. It's all spelled out for us by numbers, right? If you know one, you know the other. It's that simple. Jesus said, no man knows the day or the hour. Well, if you know the year, you know the day. You may not know the hour, but hey, I think we, we'll wait up on that day. I'm waiting up this year. I'm just going to tell you right now. She's going to wait up with me, right? The first, second, third, fourth watch will be up and waiting. But anyway, but you know in Luke 21, if you want to go over there, you don't have to. We've been over there a lot. But you know when Jesus was saying in verse 25, and there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and upon the earth distress and nations and bewilderment and perplexity, not knowing which way to turn at the roaring of the tossing of the sea, right? And three verses later, he says, look up. When you see that, for your deliverance is drawing nigh, right? Well, there's one kind of preaching, you know. He was prophesying. But then in verse 34, he says, but take heed to yourselves. Uh, I remember Owen used to say, well, there he went from preaching to meddling, right? He says, uh, and be on your guard, lest you be overburdened and depressed, weighed down with the giddiness and headache and nausea of self-indulgence and drunkenness and worldly worries and cares pertaining to this life. And that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. Right? Well, that's a good warning. We all need to watch out for that. And see, he's speaking to his people. This Jesus prophesying. Right? He's prophesying the end times. And he's saying, be careful. I'm warning you, this can happen to you. Right? This could happen to anybody. This could happen to newbie. 
this could happen to somebody that's really spiritually mature and been walking with the Lord for 40 years. This could happen. Right? Because we're in the end times and it's a real war. And Satan doesn't want God's people to come forth. Right? So look at 1 Thessalonians 5. So God... He calls us to responsibility. You know, everybody's got to, you know, you're not going to be able to say, you know, uh, when it's all said and done, you know, if you, if, say if you, say if you did die in one of the horse judgments or whatever, you know, you, you're not going to be able to go to God and say, well, he didn't tell me right. You know, it's Steve's fault. He, he, didn't, he didn't tell us right, or it's Ray's fault, because it's your responsibility. Ray and I are just men just like you, or it's so-and-so's fault, you know? And he says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, do not quench the Holy Spirit, do not spurn the gifts and utterances of the prophets, do not de depreciate prophetic revelation, nor despise instruction or exhortation or warning. But test and prove all things until you can recognize what's good to that hold fast. Well, how do you test it? You know, how do you... He, he, look, this is to every individual in the body of Christ. Every individual has to do this. They have to go to the Word... You know, the measure of thought and study that you give to the truth you hear is the measure of virtue and knowledge that comes back to you, right? Okay? But see, too many people, they test and prove it if pastor so-and-so says it. Or, you know, um, Joe Christian Television, does, does he say that? I don't know if he... He doesn't say that, so I don't know if I believe that. The... the Doctor so-and-so, he doesn't say that. Well, you don't test it by that. You test it by, thus saith the Lord, you let God be true, though every man be a liar. Right? That's how you test it. And everybody's got that responsibility. Let me tell you, you're doing yourself a disservice if the way you test it is, is, is some other preacher preaching that. You're doing yourself your, your own disservice. Right? Because I'm not going to be held accountable. I'm going to tell you what the Word says. And Ray's going to be sure, and Tammy, and all the rest of you, y'all are going to go, yep, that, that's what it says. Right? And y'all are going to hold me to it. Right? Just like I would hold him to it, or anybody else. That's what we do for each other, because we're all in it together. Right? But we have to be sure we test it with, thus saith the Lord. What does the Word say about it? Right? And sometimes that can be real tricky and we have to get in there and study. But it's our responsibility to do that. And to the best of our ability, we are not going to lead anyone astray. Go to Proverbs 14. Because if we lead you astray, we're leading ourselves astray. And I don't want to do that. You know what I mean? I mean, we come this far, I ain't going to shoot myself in the foot that way. Why would we? You know? But there's a whole, whole lot, and it's very complicated, that make, makes everyone want to quit, want, want to give up, want to relax, want to just, you know, cruise in, right? And it don't work that way. You have to finish your course, even if you... Uh, even if you have, to, you have to crawl the rest of the way, just, we got to finish the course, right? But in Proverbs 14, <coughs> verse 25, we're going to come back to that much later if you want to put a mark there, but, you know, whatever. He says, A truthful witness saves lives, but a deceitful witness speaks lies and it endangers lives. Well, Jesus came to save. 
and we're his, and we want to save lives. And that's what we, why we do what we do all the time. Because the battle is up in here, right? That's, that's where the battle is at. And Satan is very crafty at all kinds of ways. He knows how to push your buttons and get you to quit. But a faithful witness, uh, a truthful witness saves lives. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to save lives. John chapter 5. You know, while you're going there, the world has never seen a manifested Son of God except one. There was only one. Jesus was the only manifested Son of God. And He was. He was just that. He was a manifested son of God. He was made manifest, right? He was perfect in every way. And, you know, in, in Romans 8, 29, it says, you know, those whom he foreknew, right? He called that, that we would be like him. Right? I'm paraphrasing, but you know what I'm saying, right? He wants more, right? And we have not arrived. We haven't arrived yet. And it looks like an impossibility in my mirror. But, you know, with God, all things are possible. And if he, it's, his, it's his deal. You know, he wants to do it. So we want to let him do it, right? So we're going to try to finish this course. In Jesus' name, we are going to finish the course. And even if we died trying, we're going to finish the course, right? But in uh, John chapter 5, verse 30, now this is Jesus, right? So if you feel like, you know, I can't do this, well, look what he says. I am able to do nothing from myself independently of my own accord, but only as I am taught by God and I get his orders. Even as I hear, I judge. I decide as I am bidden to decide, and my judgment is right because I do not seek and consult my own will, but uh, uh, my own aim. I don't do what's pleasing to me, but only the will and pleasure of the Father who sent me. I, if I alone testify in my behalf, my testimony is not valid and cannot be worth anything, Right? There's another who testifies concerning me, and I know and am certain that his evidence on my behalf is true and valid. Go to verse 41. Jesus further says, I, re I receive not glory from men. I crave no human honor. I look for no, no mortal fame. But I... No, but I know you and recognize and understand that you have not the love of God in you. This is what he was telling to the religious leaders of that day, right? Jesus wasn't, he wasn't looking for fame among men, just like we're not. Ray and I, we're not looking for fame. We're not trying to get people to follow us. We're trying to get people to follow Jesus, right? We don't want any fame. I don't want that. We're, why would you follow me? I'm following him, and we're trying to get you to follow him. That's all, right? I've come in my Father's name, verse 43, and with his power, and you do not receive me. But if another comes in his own name, in his own power, and with no other authority but himself, you'll receive him, and you'll give him your approval. See what I mean by... This is what meant, they, this is what they were doing back then, this is what people do now. You know, if they're on the television screen, oh, they must know. Well, do they? Now, I'm going to tell you, a whole lot of them don't. You know they don't because we checked it out with the Word. We tested and proved it. We said, ah, that's not right. That's wrong. And we don't brand oh, a false prophet or a heretic or anything. No, they just don't have it right. Okay, Lord, help them. Help them to see, Lord. Because a lot of times, they just received it. Somebody else told them, 
They admired and trusted somebody, you know, in the body of Christ, and they're just replicating an error that they learned. And, you know, we've done that here, and we've corrected a lot of that here, you know. Those old things, it wasn't really hurting us because we were getting a whole lot with us, but things got unsealed. God showed us new revelation, new understanding, and I'll tell you what, Owen Cain, bless his heart, the man wanted to know. I remember him sitting right over there and he's pointing at that. I want to know what that means. Right? And, you know, he didn't get it. and he, he went on to be with the Lord. Right? But he wanted it. And so do we. Right? Uh, how is it possible for you to believe and uh, receive praise and honor and glory from one another, and yet you don't not seek the praise and honor and glory which comes from Him who alone is God. Well, you know, it's really important that it doesn't matter who it is, they're on television, the internet, whatever. We test and prove it by the Word of God. It's very important, and it's going to be more and more critical as time goes on because the Antichrist is going to begin to come to power. And, you know, we're in the time of the leopard right now. The leopard is bringing transparency to the world conspiracy, right? And the Antichrist, he's going to have the answers for that, right? His answers. And the world is going to go, wow, that sounds and looks real good because they saw, hey, we've been duped by the world elite bankers and all that for all these hundreds of years, right? And now this guy's got the, he's got the plan, right? We've got to go by what the Word says, right? Go to 1 Peter 4. <coughs> Because let me tell you, Jesus said, hey, be careful that no one deceives you. You know, he says, many false prophets shall rise and uh, they will sh shall lead many into error, right? People talk about, uh, when's the, the, there's going to be a great revival, you know? The Bible doesn't speak of that. The Bible speaks of a great falling away. Right? So when they're saying there's going to be a great revival, is that true? No, it's not true. It doesn't say that. There'll be a great revival in the wilderness. Right? That's when there'll be a great revival. Wow. In the wilderness, the body of Christ who didn't get ready. 1 Peter 4, 1. So, since Christ suffered in the flesh for us, for you, arm yourselves with the same thought and purpose, patiently to suffer rather than fail to please God. For whoever has suffered in the flesh, having the mind of Christ, is done with intentional sin, has stopped pleasing himself in the world, and pleases God. That's all we want to do. We just want to please God. You know, if if what we say just makes everybody mad, if God says it and he tells us to say it, then we have to say it, right? Because our flesh doesn't like it either, right? But flesh, that's just flesh. Flesh doesn't like anything It makes it uncomfortable, right? So that we can no longer spend the rest of our natural lives living by his own appetites and desires, but... Live for what God wills. For the time has already passed and suffices for doing what the Gentiles like to do. Living as you have done in shameless, insolent wantonness, in lustful desires, drunkenness, reveling, drinking bouts, and abominable, lawless idolatries. And they're astonished and they think it's very queer that you not now run with them hand in hand in the same excesses of dissipation, and they abuse you. You ever get that? Man, I used to get that all the time when I was a, became a Christian. 
the people, my brothers and all of our old friends, they, they would abuse me. Because, you know, now as a you know, Jesus kid and all that stuff. And they, they'd make fun of me. and You know, it didn't really bother me because I loved what I was doing. Man, when I came to the Lord, I just loved it. I absolutely loved it. And I thought, you know, they're the ones missing out. Uh, but they will have to give an account to him who's ready to judge and pass sentence on the living and the dead. For this is why the good news was preached, right? Even to the dead, that through though judged in fleshly bodies as men are, they might live in the Spirit as God does. Right? Preach to the dead. Well, that's what Jesus did. He, he died on, in his flesh, but he was made alive in the Spirit, and he went and preached to the souls in prison who long ago in the days of Noah had been disobedient. Right? That's preaching to the dead. Right? Wow. Didn't stop Jesus. Right? It didn't stop him. He was made alive in the Spirit. Hey, I'll go to another dimension. I've got to preach to them over there that he paid the price. Colossians 1. I mean, we are entering an amazing time. Amazing time. A very uh, treacherous time. No doubt about that. Colossians 1.19 For it has pleased the Father that all the divine fullness, that the sum of divine perfection should dwell in Him permanently, in Jesus, and God purposed that through Him all things should be completely reconciled back to Himself, whether on earth or in heaven, as through Him the Father made peace by means of the blood of His cross. It was all done on the cross. Nothing more to do. He didn't have to go to hell and beat the devil up since he wasn't there, right? And although you at one time were estranged and alienated from him and were of hostile attitude of mind and your wicked activities, remember those days? Yet now has Christ reconciled you to God in the body of his flesh through death, in order to present you holy and faultless and irreproachable in his presence. And this he will do, provided that you continue to stay with and in the faith. See, there, there's, there's a, something on your part that has to be done. Right? All the Calvinist stuff, that don't work. You know, that's, that's just error. Right? Provided that you stay with and in the faith, well grounded and settled, steadfast, not shifting or moving away from the hope, uh, the glad tidings of the gospel which you heard, which has been preached to every person under heaven. Right? I mean, wow. He, uh, even now I rejoice in the midst of my suffering on your behalf. And in my own person I'm making up whatever is still lacking and reigns to be completed. On our part of Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. He says, in it, Paul says, I became a minister in accordance with the divine stewardship was entrusted to me for you to make the word of God fully known among you fully known. The mystery of which was hidden for ages and generations, but is now revealed to his holy people. Right? Remember how we've talked throughout the last few years how a whole lot of these things, these mysteries were sealed until the time of the end. And then God begins to unseal it. Why? Because it's the time of the end and it's for us and we need to know it. And with revelation, we can have transformation. And with transformation, you can have glorification. Right? Because we're going to need it. 
to whom God was pleased to make known how great for the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of his mystery, which is Christ within you and among you the hope of glory. That's our hope, Christ in us, right? That is our hope. You know, Paul said, uh, he, he talked about that, uh, that he was suffering birth pangs until Christ is completely and permanently formed within you. Right? He just felt that responsibility to the body. Because getting born again and getting started, that ain't the end. That's just the beginning. Right? Now the transformation process begins. And as you know, it can go on for a long time. Right? In him we preach and proclaim, warning and admonishing everyone and instructing everyone in all wisdom that we may present every person mature, full grown, fully initiated, complete and perfect in Christ, the anointed one. Right? Wow, that was a mouthful. You know, that's the process, that's God's plan. He expects perfect spiritual maturity. That's what he's called us to. You know, great. You know, if you, if you die and, and the blood of Jesus covers you, wonderful. But that ain't God's highest calling for you. His highest calling for you is to make, bring you to full maturity. Right? Make everybody complete. That's why Jesus did what he did. Right? So, let's, let's go to Revelation 17. And let's talk about, you know, what we should warn each other about. You know, because, hey, I like the preaching to be fresh and full and rosy and cheerful. I like that. Who wouldn't? We've, we've had a lot of that. And we had a lot of that when we first got saved, for sure. Right? I mean, it was awesome, but... As time went on, the reality sets in, hey, we're in the last days. Jesus is coming back. The Antichrist is going to come to power. And Jesus warned everybody, there's going to be great deception. So we have to watch out after one another to see that no one falls back from and fails to secure God's grace. It's our responsibility for each other, right? Right? I mean, that's what he's called. We're a body. We love each other with that kind of love. And nobody gets left behind. In Revelation uh, 17, 1, he says, One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls then came and spoke to me, saying, Come with me and I will show you the doom of the great harlot who is seated on many waters. Well, that's sad. It's the doom of the great harlot, right? She with whom the leaders of the earth have joined in prostitution, right? Idolatry. Have you noticed? You know, truth has fallen at the gate. And have joined in prostitution. And with the wine whose immorality the inhabitants of the earth have become intoxicated. Have you ever seen so much intoxication in your life? I'm talking about not just wine and alcohol. I'm talking with everything. Everything. Intoxicated with television, entertainment, uh, sports. I mean, you name it. And all the junk on the internet, people get intoxicated with that stuff. Right? And the angel bore me away in the spirit into the desert. I saw a woman seated on a scarlet beast that was all covered with blasphemous titles. He had seven heads and ten horns, and the woman, woman robed in purple and scarlet, bedecked with gold, precious stones, and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of the accursed offenses and the filth of her lewdness and vice. 
Now look at that. These are kind of royal colors. Scarlet, purple, you know, gold, a golden cup. The more you study this stuff, you more, the more you see counterfeits. Right? What is lewdness and vice and accursed offenses doing in a golden cup? Right? Well, these are counterfeits to what should be. Right? And on her forehead there was inscribed a name of mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes, of the filth and atrocities and abominations of the earth. And I also saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs for Jesus. And when I saw her, I was utterly amazed and wondered greatly. I mean, this guy was smacked down. It was, whoa, 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 wow. He's blown away by what he saw, right, with this harlot Right? Well, we're going to get into it. What exactly that is. Go to chapter 18. I mean, y'all do it all the time. You see stuff on TV or on the internet, and you're like, yeah, uh, what's the matter? What happened? You know, you're just utterly amazed. <laughs> wow. A Make America Great hat makes you fearful and uncomfortable and ooh. What's wrong with people, you know? But they're mind controlled. That's what's wrong with them. They're mind controlled. That's what all of this is. It's mind control, but there's a reason for it. You don't have to be mind controlled. All right? Then... 18, verse 1, I saw another angel descending from heaven, possessing great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his radiance and splendor. And he shouted with a mighty voice, she's fallen, mighty Babylon is fallen. She has become a resort and a dwelling place for demons. Right? We've talked about that, resort even being in the church. A dungeon haunted by every loathsome spirit, an abode for every filthy and detestable bird. For all nations have drunk the wine of her passionate unchastity, and the rulers and leaders of the earth have joined with her in committing fornication. Right? It's harlotry, idolatry, and the businessmen of the earth have become rich with the wealth of her excessive luxury and wantonness. And then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out from her, my people, so that you may not share in her sins and neither participate in her plagues. Okay? For her iniquities are piled as high as heaven, and God has remembered her wickedness and crimes, and he calls them up for settlement. The time for settlement is here. God's going to call it up. He isn't just going to keep... We think, oh, God's not doing anything. He's not going to do anything. No. He's doing something and He's going to do something. And He's saying, hey, get out of it. Get away from it. I'm fixing to smack it down. Right? He's fixing to judge it. Okay? And he's telling his body, get out of there. Get away from that stuff. All right, Hebrews 13. He's telling his church to get out of it. These are all systems of men. If you boil it down, it, 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 of course it all boils down to self, but just follow the money on everything because, you know, we live in a time where people are just, you know, they crave to be wealthy, all right? And that's the most important thing to them is money. And that's, you follow the money on all this stuff. 
The NFL is a mega, mega billion dollar biz year business. Every year, billions and billions of dollars. <laughs> Think it's not rigged? For billions and billions of dollars? Right? And whether it's rigged or not, it doesn't matter. They have people hooked. Grown men who are obsessed with it that should be using that energy to fight against the devil and for the Lord. And they're all hung up on football like it's really important. And it's not. It's not important at all. It'll pass. It'll just come to pass and go on. It's not important. If they knew what was fixing to happen, they would just, they would throw it out like it was filth. But they don't know what's fixing to happen. It's all fixing to change because God ain't winking at it. He's going to deal with it. It's idolatry. It's harlotry. Hebrews 13, verse 12, Therefore Jesus also suffered outside the city's gate in order that he might purify and consecrate the people through the shedding of his blood and set them apart as holy. Wow. You know, that's not a popular message, is it? The gimme, 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 if my, even if my name ain't Jimmy, right? Let us then go forth from all that would prevent us to him outside the camp bearing the contempt and the abuse and the shame with him. For here we have no permanent city, but we are looking for one which is to come. Again, Babylon, the city Babylon, that's a counterfeit to the new Jerusalem. Right? Another counterfeit. Satan counterfeits everything. He's just a liar. When he speaks a lie, he speaks what's natural to him. He don't tell the truth. He, when he speaks, it's a lie. That's what his nature is. Right? And God wants us to come out of the camp. Right? That's why we don't, we don't involve ourselves with mainstream Christianity. Mainstream Christianity is a business. We come out of that. We don't we don't partake of that. Look, every church in America, we'll just say America is where we live, is having their board meetings like we have our board meetings. And we, in our board meetings, you know, we look at, the, at our financial statement, right? And we, we look at what it looks like, right? And we're like, well, I don't look good. <laughs> and then we have our little talk, and then we boil it down to, well, the just shall live by faith and in their faithfulness. God, <laughs> it's your deal, it's not ours. So, you know, we're, we're going to try to do whatever you want us to do, which is teach the truth. We're going to preach the truth, right? But a whole lot of board meetings across America, they go, well, we got to stay in business, so... We're going to start having Easter egg hunts and um, we're going to have Halloween parties and we're going to have Christmas parties and we'll hire a Santa and on and on. And we'll get smoke machines or fog machines and you know, we'll get everybody in bright colored costumes and, and we'll rock out on a stage and that'll bring people in because they're saying, hey, 200 churches in America are folding up every week and we don't want to be one of them because, you know, we want to keep our jobs. And so they embrace a lie instead of embracing the truth. Okay? So they love that more than they love the truth. Look, if we have to sell this building and we fold up and Romans 8 doesn't become a church anymore, Okay, I, I don't know what we did wrong, God, but it isn't because we didn't try to do God's will. We are going to try to do God's will, and we are not. I mean, he and I went and saw a guy one time, and he advised us. 
He said, you want, you want to grow that church? You know, he's giving us some real sage advice, right, Ray? He says, you, you just need to get you, you know, rent you a big old tent. And on Easter, you know, you need to have Easter egg hunts and do all that and, you know, stuff for the kids. And, and we just, he and I, man, we were poker face, you know. We just looked at the guy, you know, and then we got out to the truck and we closed the door and looked at each other and just busted up laughing. We ain't going to do that. Because <laughs> we ain't going to do that. And we won't have to do that because the just live by faith, not by manipulating people to come into the body of Christ. God will call them and He'll bring them in. However He wants to do it, He can drop a sack of gold on our roof if He wants to do it. Right? And, or He might just let us struggle through. He might let us do it. Right? It doesn't matter because God is still God. He's still God. Over there in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul said, man, we were even made to feel like death that we wouldn't trust in ourselves. Wow. I mean, you know, we talked last time about Paul and all of the trials and struggles he went through through. Man, that doesn't, I don't even, doesn't even come near to me what that guy went through. And yet he just kept on going. I ha my hat's off to that guy. He was amazing. Anyway, uh, but we come out of the camp, you know. We're not in mainstream. That's just the way it is. We let God be true, Right? Uh, Hebrews uh, 11, Hebrews 11, a couple pages over. All right, he's saying, come out of Babylon, you know, that city where the harlot is. You see, the, the harlot is a spirit, right? And guess where it is? It's in all the people. That's where it is. The harlot is in everybody. That's why he's getting it out of us. He makes us to feel godly grief and it brings forth repentance. And so he can deliver us from evil. Hebrews 11, 8. Urged on by faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed, and went forth to the place which was destined to receive his inheritance. He went, although he did not know or trouble his mind about where he was to go. Wow. See, he came out of the Ur of Chaldees. Well, that was, I mean, that was the civilization back then. That was, that was the place, right? That was like America today. He, he came out of it. He didn't trouble his mind. Prompted by faith, he dwelt as a temporary resident in the land, which was designated in the promise, in a strange country, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs with him of the same promise. For he was waiting expectantly and confidently, looking forward to the city, which has fixed and firm foundations, whose architect and builder is God. See, we have a city, but it ain't Babylon. It's the new Jerusalem, right? And we're going to have this Jerusalem before the new Jerusalem. We're going to go up every year and celebrate, right? At the Feast of Tabernacles. And if you don't go up, it ain't going to rain on your land, right? How's that for judgment? Go to verse 24. And aroused by faith, Moses, when he had grown to maturity and become great, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter because he preferred to share the oppression and suffer the hardships and bear the shame of the people of God rather than have a, the fleeting enjoyment of a sinful life. 
he considered the contempt and abuse and shame born for Christ to be greater wealth than all the treasures of Egypt, for he looked forward in a way to the reward. Right? That's what we got to have our vision. We got to look forward to the reward. There is a reward. There is a city. And it ain't Babylon. He's saying, come out of Babylon. Second Corinthians 6. Man, time flies when you're having fun. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Do not be unequally, unequally yoked with unbelievers. Do not make mismated alliances with them or come under a different yoke with them, inconsistent with your faith. What partnership have right living and right standing with God with iniquity and lawlessness? How can light have fellowship with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? What agreement between a temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Even as God has said, I will dwell with and among them, and I will be walk with and among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. So, come out from among and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord, and touch not any unclean thing. And I'll receive you kindly and treat you with favor, and I'll be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. All right, so, and, and listen to this. Verse, chapter 7, the next verse. Therefore, since these great promises are ours, uh, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that contaminates and defiles body and spirit and bring our consecration to completeness in the reverential fear of the Lord. You know, the reverential fear of the Lord includes the hatred of evil, right? Right? It's the beginning of wisdom, the very choice part of wisdom, right? So we have something to do on our part. You know, he says, let us cleanse ourselves. Well, that means, you know, by act of your will, hey, I'm not going to do that anymore. Right? Yeah, the blood of Jesus cleanses you, right? But you know what you do? You cleanse yourself by making your, um, by your will saying, hey, I want the blood of Jesus and I'm going to stop doing that. Right? That's what it means by that. We have a part to cleanse ourselves. We have a will, in other words. Right? Just like the Holy Spirit doesn't make you speak in tongues. When has the Holy Spirit ever made you speak in tongues? Never. Never, ever, ever. No. You have to do it. Same thing, right? By act of your will, you speak in tongues. But it's still tongues. Because you don't know what you're saying. Second Timothy. Two. But God knows. Hey, let me tell you, speaking in tongues is powerful. It's powerful. You want revelation in your life? Speak in tongues. You feel down and not very close to God? Speak in tongues. It will bring God's presence to you, let me tell you. It may not be that very second, but I strongly urge every believer that's filled with the Holy Spirit, practice that. It, it edifies you. It builds you up. It just does wonders for your life. It'll get you there. Guaranteed. I've done it so many times. Second uh, Timothy 2... 19, but the firm foundation of God stands, sure and unshaken, bearing this seal. 
the Lord knows who are his. And that let everyone who names the name of the Lord give up all iniquity and stand aloof from it. But in the great house, they're not only vessels of gold and silver, but of wood and earthenware, and some for honorable and noble use, and some for menial and ignoble use. So whoever cleanses himself from what is ignoble and unclean, who separates himself with contact, from contact with contaminating and corrupting influences, will then himself be a vessel set apart and useful for honorable and noble purposes, consecrated and profitable to the master, fit and ready for any good work. You see how important that is to separate yourself, to cleanse yourself, to consecrate yourself? Do you see that? Actually, God does the consecrating, but I'm just saying by the act of your will, right? He will do that, right? These are things that are super, super important from, uh, for us for here on because we've crossed a line here. We've crossed a line. I'm telling you, I will tell you this, Christian persecution is going to increase a lot. You're going to see it. The haters out there are going to hate more. And they feel like they need to voice it. All right, go to Jeremiah chapter 2. Because I'm going to Jeremiah 2. Because we're going to talk about harlotry. Because the harlot is seated on many waters. It's where we live, right? We know we are of God and the whole world around us is under the power of the evil one, right? Atrocities, abominable practices. This is happening all around you and you don't even know it. If you knew police and people like that, they would tell you stuff you wish you hadn't heard and it's happening right in your neighborhood. Right? And they hear it all the time. And that's only the ones they know about. But in Jeremiah 2, he confronts Israel about their harlotry. Right? The harlot is seated on many waters. It's a type of what's going on today because it's flesh. It's always been the same thing. Right? It's always the same. Jeremiah 2.11 has a nation changed its gods even though they are not gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be astonished and appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked and shrivel up in horror, says the Lord, the behavior of the people. See? John on the island of Patmos, when he saw the harlot, he was astonished. Right? Well, saying that here. Right? Be astonished and appalled, for my people have committed two evils. This is my people, remember. All right? 83% of the population of America doesn't go to church. 83%. There's a remnant now. Only 17%. Think about that. What are these 83% doing? Right? That call themselves Christian, what is it, 60 something percent of Americans call, or, right, what, call themselves Christians, right? The nuns. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they've hewn for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns which cannot hold water. All right? You know, he's the fountain of living water. He gave us the Holy Spirit. You know, out of your innermost being shall flow rivers of living water, right? Revelation just pouring up inside of you, right? But they exchanged that for cisterns, something they just 
carve out of the ground and put water in it, and you get little squigglies in there, and it's not, it's living water, all right. It's living with all kinds of creatures, right? Not sparkling, clean, living water like he wanted us, wants us to have, right? Uh, go to chapter, no, go to verse 19. Your own wickedness shall ch chasten and correct you. And your backslidings and desertion of faith shall reprove you. Know therefore and recognize that this is an evil and bitter thing. You've forsaken the Lord your God. You're indifferent to me, and the fear of me is not in you. For long ago I broke your yoke and burst your bonds. And long ago, you shattered the yoke and snapped the bonds of my law, which I put upon you. You said, I will not serve and obey you, for upon every high hill and under every green tree, you prostrated yourself, playing the harlot. Yet, I had planted you a choice vine, holy of pure seed, how then have you turned into degenerate shoots of wild vine, alien to me? For though you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, yet your iniquity and guilt are still upon you. You are spotted, dirty, stained before me, says the Lord. He's talking to his people, and this is what's in the church today. This is it. We're here. We're in the end times. See, everybody goes to these big places and they're all fancy and new and everything's great. New carpet and da-da-da and they have all the pleasantries and everybody dresses up and they all look real nice. But you're just seeing a facade. You know, Jesus, Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said, you're like whitewashed tombs. You know, on the outside, you're all pretty and whitewashed, but inside, you're full of lots of nasty stuff, right? And see, God wants to get the nasty stuff out of us. But if nobody ever preaches that, and they just preach prosperity and hyper grace and all these kinds of things, nobody ever deals with it. They don't do their cleansing of themselves, right? And they just, you know, go to the church up there in South Lake over there in North Dallas or wherever, and it's all real nice and clean and everything's just real, everybody's happy, right? And everybody's blessed, right? But they're all full of dead men's bones. See, on the inside, they're not cleansed. They're not changed because they're not telling them to be. They're not telling them what God requires, right? And so we wonder why there's a vast host in the great tribulation, in the wrath of God. Oh, oh, it says God's not appointed us to wrath. Then why are they there? He hadn't appointed us to wrath, then why are they there? Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 through 17. A vast host whom no one could count died in the wrath of God. How come? Because they were never told that, hey, God requires holiness and consecration and purity and all those things. That's what he requires. Oh, well, that's what the blood of Jesus does. Come on. If it was the blood of Jesus, he would have said that. That's not what we just read. I mean, thank God we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And God's very patient with us, but He does expect us to come to full maturity, right? That we actually live that clean life. Not just, you know, Him having to change our diapers every 15 minutes. You know what I'm saying? There's a difference. Chapter 4. Verse 1, if you will return, O Israel, says the Lord, if you will return to me and if you will put away your abominable false gods out of my sight and not stray and waver, 
If you will swear as the Lord lives in truth, in judgment and justice, in righteousness, then nations will bless themselves in him, and in him will they glory. For thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, break up the ground left uncultivated for a season, so that you may not sow among thorns. Circumcise yourself to the Lord and take away the foreskin of your hearts, you men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my wrath go forth like fire and burn so that no one can quench it because of the evil of your doings. He's talking to his people. Then and now. Then and now. Verse 23. In a vision, Jeremiah sees Judah laid waste by conquest. He looked at the land, and behold, it was as at the time of creation. Right? What was that? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was in the face of the great deep. Right? When Satan fell in verse 2, Genesis 1, verse 2, is what he's saying. It was... It looked like the land, behold, it was at the time when Satan fell. That's what he's saying. Waste and vacant, void, and at the heavens, and they had no light. And I looked at the mountains, and behold, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly to and fro. And I looked, behold, and there was no man, and all the birds of the air had fled. And I looked, and behold, the fruitful land was a desert, and all its cities were laid waste before the Lord's presence, before his fierce anger. Thus says the Lord, the whole land will be a desolation, yet I will not make a full and complete end of it. For this is the will, for, for this will the earth mourn and the heavens above black, because I have spoken, I have purposed. I will not relent, nor will I turn back. Every city flees because of the noise of horsemen and bowmen. They go into the thickens and climb the rocks. Every city is forsaken. Not a man dwells in them. And you, when you are made desolate, what will you do? Though you clothe yourself with scarlet, though you deck yourself with ornaments of gold. See, sounds familiar, doesn't it? Though you paint your eyelids and make them look farther apart. In vain you beautify yourselves. Your lovers despise you, they seek your life. For I have heard a cry as of a woman in travail, the anguish of one who brings forth her first child, the cry of the daughter of Zion who gasps for breath, who spreads her hand saying, Woe is me now, I am fainting before the murderers. You see that? She brings forth, and they are undone. They don't know what to do, right? They're in, they brought forth the man-child. Now, we're left here, right? But the beauty of it is, they will cry out, and they will repent, and God will save them if his conditions are met. Go to chapter 5. Run to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem. See now and take notice. Seek in her broad squares to see if you can find a man, who, one who does justice, who seeks truth and sincerity and faithfulness. I will pardon. And though they say, as the Lord lives, surely they swear falsely. O Lord, do not your eyes look on truth. You have stricken them, but they have not grieved. You have consumed them, but they have refused to take correction and instruction. They have made their faces harder than a rock. They have refused to repent and return to you. Then I said, surely these are only the poor. They are sinfully foolish and have no understanding, for they know not the way of the Lord, the judgment of their God. I will go to the great men and will seek them, for they must know the way of the Lord, the judgment of their God, but I found the very reverse to be true. These had all alike broken the yoke and burst the bonds. 
right? Therefore, a lion comes out of the forest, shall slay them. A wolf in the desert shall destroy them. A leopard shall lie in waste, wait against their cities. Everyone who goes out of them shall be torn in pieces because the transgressions are many. Their backsliding and totally desertion of faith are increased and become great and mighty. See, he says, hey, I went to the rich people, the ones with all the money and the suits and the houses and everything, and it was the very opposite. They're just as bad, if not worse, right? Because of the deceitfulness and the glamour of riches, right? They're just, their houses are filled with thorns. Go to verse 21. So hear now, foolish people without understanding, who have eyes and see not, and ears and hear not. Do you not hear, fear and reverence me, says the Lord? Do you not tremble before me? I place the sound for the boundary of the sea, the perpetual barrier beyond which it cannot pass, and all the everlasting ordinances beyond which it cannot go. And though the waves of the sea toss and shake themselves, yet they cannot prevail against the feeble sands. Uh, and though the billows roar, they cannot pass over the barrier. Is not such a God to be reverently feared and worshipped? But these people have hearts that draw back from God and wills that rebel against them. They revolt and quit His service and have gone astray into idolatry. Nor do they say in their hearts, let us now reverently fear and worship the Lord our God who gives rain, both the autumn and spring rain and season, who reserves and keeps for us the appointed weeks of the harvest. Your iniquities have turned these blessings away and your sins have kept good harvest from you. For among my people are found wicked men. Listen, among my people are found wicked men. Listen to this. They watch like fowlers who lie in wait. They set a trap. They catch men. As a bird, a cage is full of birds, so are their houses full of deceit and treachery. Therefore, they become rich, right? They become great and grown rich. They have grown fat and sleek. Yes, they surpass in deeds of wickedness. They do not judge and plead with justice the cause of the fatherless that they may prosper. They do not defend the rights of the needy. Shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord? Shall I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? An appalling and horrible thing has come to pass in the land. See, there it is again. When he saw the harlot, he was shocked. He was appalled. He said, listen, the prophets prophesy falsely. And the priests exercise rule by the prophets, by means of the prophets. And my people love to have it so. But what will you do when the end comes? You see that? In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says, because they did not love the truth, God sends upon them a misleading influence, a working of error, and strong delusion to make people, Christian people, believe what's false. Right? They're, these men in the church have become sleek and fat and rich off of the people. They fleece the flock to keep the business going. Right? They have their board meetings and say, hey, we can do this. You know what it is? It's witchcraft. They manipulate the congregations to do their bidding so the cash continues to flow in. And they become rich. And he's saying, hey, the prophets prophesy falsely. Hey, you don't have to worry about anything. There's a pre-tribulation rapture. The sky is going to open up and every Christian is going to go. And the Bible don't teach that, right, does it? It doesn't teach that. And anybody that's a serious student of the Word knows what the requirements are, right? And it's a very small group of people 
who actually go in a catching away. Right? They don't even know what it's about. They don't even know that being caught away is it's, it's just a byproduct of what they become. Right? They become like Jesus. And that is what he died for, and that is our hope. Our hope is to be like him. That this, this uh, carnal part of us, this old nature of us, that, that that'll be removed and God gives us his new nature brought forth fully mature, right? But what will you do when the end comes, right? Not the end come, but the end comes. They got the end come right now. But that ain't going to be nothing. You can't eat dollar bills, not even hundred dollar bills. Sorry. It just won't cut it. But I say this to you tonight because this is what, where we live. The harlot is a spirit that's in the, it pervades the entire planet in human beings. And we all have to watch out. He's saying, hey, Come out of that. We have to watch out so that we're not contaminated with these corrupting influences and that we be caught, oh, we're not prepared for this. We're not prepared for God's next move, which is Jesus coming back in the flesh to put the devil in prison and rule the earth for a thousand years. Wouldn't that be a bummer? After all we've heard that we're not prepared, but we can be. It doesn't matter how you feel. Just, you know, if you read those first five chapters of Jeremiah, I just hit the highlights on it. You know what it produces in you? Godly grief. You just, oh, Lord, there's too much of this in me. Right? Well, that's good because it produces repentance and deliverance from evil. And that's what we need. Right? So let's continue and finish this course that God has called us to. Amen? Well, thank you, Father, that he who began a good work in us will continue that good work right up until the time of his return and provided that we stay in the faith that you will present us holy and faultless and irreproachable in your presence. And we ask that you move upon all the people here and those watching, those in our congregation, that you will produce that reverential fear of the Lord that will what, bring forth the, the desired results that you want. And we thank you and praise you and we ask you in Jesus' name. Amen.